Well, Martin, thank you very much for the introduction and a special thanks to the Royal Institution in London for this opportunity to share with you uh, some aspects uh, relating to the life and works of, of John Tyndall. Um, of course, I would love to be in London, uh, the, the famous uh, theatre, um, but in these times, I think it we're very fortunate that we have this technology, the technology that we work on here in Tyndall and many others, to allow us to stay uh, in connection both with work uh, and with friends. So thank you to everyone who's who's joined this evening, and I hope I can bring you some uh, new insights into John Tyndall. So if I move now to the slides. <clears throat> so here is a picture of John Tyndall, and this is to say happy 200th birthday to Tyndall because he was most probably born in 1820. Um, so we're celebrating uh, his 200th birthday. The reason I say probably is a lot of records were lost in the early part of the 20th century uh, in Ireland, um, including from my own family and also for Tyndall's. So um, it is probably his 200th birthday. In terms of Tyndall and what he worked on, it is uh, dizzying the amount of different areas of study uh, he was involved with. And to provide you with some examples, there was magnetism and diamagnetism. This is a piece of pyrolytic graphite floating above magnets. He was an um, alpine uh, mountain climber and made the first of a ascent of uh, one peak uh, in Switzerland. He worked on the absorption of uh, infrared gases by the at atmosphere, which is the origin of the um, global warming, which I'll cover is very important today. As an educator and science communicator, he worked to show you could bend light down a falling stream of water. He worked on glaciers. He worked on how to get optically pure air and germ theory. He worked on foghorns and Tyndall scattering, for example, why your eye is blue. <coughs> and <clears throat> the reason I'm here talk talking about uh, Tyndall in particular is that Tyndall took over as the director of the Royal Institution after uh, Michael Faraday died in 1867. And our, the institute where I work, you know, Tyndall National Institute, University College Cork was named after John Tyndall in recognition of the great work he did in experimental science in the 19th century. This is a picture of Tyndall um, in the centre. We're based in Cork on the south coast of Ireland. We have around 600 uh, staff and students from 52 different nationalities. And we work in the hardware that underpins the information and communication age that uh, we currently live in, covering aspects of communication, health, energy, and also um, uh, agriculture and the use of uh, technology in agriculture. <clears throat> Though what this building used to be, and it's on the River Lee, if you go back to around about the 1780s, it was a distillery and we were converting barley and water uh, into whiskey. Um, but from the 1980s, it's more about taking enthusiastic and talented people and what comes out is their ideas, publications, PhDs, and spin-out companies. For example, there's a recent spin-out company called InfiniLED, who were bought by Oculus, who are now the, uh, Facebook Virtual Reality Labs. I was asked um, when putting this talk together, um, do you work in, what area do you work in yourself um, in, in Tyndall? So this is a picture of my group uh, from a couple of years ago. We work in nanoelectronic materials and devices. So these are the devices which underpin things from mobile phones to desktop computers, to gaming, to the servers, which uh, server farms which drive the internet. And if you were to go inside all of these devices and look down to what is really powering them, you would come to the chips or the integrated circuits 
and microprocessors which drive these technologies. And this is what myself and my group are working in. So if you were to take one of these integrated circuits, which to give you a feeling for size would be about two by two centimeters. If you were to cut it and look edge on and zoom in about 100,000 times, you would see the device, which is at the heart of the information and communication age. It's called a transistor. It's in silicon, the semiconductor silicon, and you use a gate to control current flowing through the device. This is silicon. So we work in these semiconductors and how to make them more energy efficient. And these transistors are a switch, a solid state switch that can be on or off. So it works on base two. Uh, we were counting base 10 because uh, yeah, we've got 10 fingers, but computers are a switch on and off and they work on logical gates. And this is interesting because it also brings us back to cork because it, computers work on boolean logic and bool um, took up the position of being the first professor of mathematics in university college cork in 1849 he moved over from uh, lincoln where he was a teacher and he worked on the laws of thought and the mathematics behind the laws of thought and it wasn't until many years later that claude shannon realized that you could use um, the mathematics of Boole to build circuits and later uh, integrated circuits. So this naturally got me curious. Did John Tyndall work in semiconductors because he worked in this enormous variety of, uh, of different uh, disciplines? As far as I can see, he didn't, but the previous director of the laboratory did. This is a picture of Michael Faraday um, he was the second director of the Royal Institution, and he worked on the material in black in the center, silver sulfide surrounded by calcite. And what he noticed in 1833 is the extraordinary case of silver sulfide, that when he brought a lamp in and heated the material, its conducting power increased. And when he took the lamp away, the effect reversed. And so this was the first known observation of semiconductors in 1833. Um, I'd just like to say a word about research because um, I'm in a research center and I'm sure you've ever been curious. I was curious recently, why do we do research? Why do we search again? Um, why don't we do pre-search? Why don't we boldly search where no one has searched before? But this is not the um, origin of the word. The origin of the word is from now obsolete French, where if you put the RE before a word, you intensify the word that follows. So to do research is to do an intense search. Um, the reason I was keen to leave this in is because I think it brings us nicely back to Tyndall, because he did do very intense experimental research on a very wide variety of, of topics here as shown. And I can't cover them all this evening. So I thought I would cover four aspects that Tyndall was involved in. His first work, which brought him to the attention of uh, the Royal Institution in London, was his work on diamagnetism. So I'll cover this. Um, infrared uh, absorption in gases, which is um, the underlying uh, cause of, the, of global warming. I'll cover this. As a demonstrator and science communicator, bending light. And finally, uh, Tyndall scattering. Now, as I can't cover everything, I thought I would have um, and ask the audience. So this is the poll uh, Martin mentioned in the middle. I'll do one slide on either his uh, activities in alpine mountaineering, optically pure air and germ theory, foghorns or glaciers. So um, when you get an opportunity, please uh, go to the, um, the voting area and vote for one of these and at the end I will um, uh, choose the one which gets the most votes. So here's the outline of the talk. So going first to Tyndall and early years. Tyndall was born um, in, in uh, Lachlan Bridge in uh, County Carlow in Ireland. Uh, 
he made particular note on one of his teachers, um, John Conwell, who really inspired him in terms of mathematics and English composition, drawing and surveying. He then went on to work as, in his uh, late teens, as part of the Ordnance Survey of Ireland. Um, he was very talented, so he got snapped up for the Ordnance Survey of Great Britain. And just around about this time, in the early 80s, there was the railway building mania. So he got involved in construction planning for the building of the railways in, um, in uh, Great Britain. When the railway mania subsided, he then uh, became a teacher, a teacher of uh, mathematics and surveying at Queenswood College in Hampshire. And it was here that he met Edward Franklin, who was also a teacher and was one of the originators of organometallic chemistry and also the concept of valence. And after about two years, they decided that they wanted to learn more, and particularly in experimental uh, science and experimental physics. And so the, there was not an opportunity, as I understand, at this point to do a PhD anywhere in England, but there was abroad. So they decided to move um, to Marburg. But there's a comment here which I think is really uh, telling. The students uh, really liked him uh, as a teacher, and they were certainly sad to see him go. And he gives here this quote um, from Emerson to explain why he was moving on, in that all the sun, the stars, science, chemistry, geology, they're all but the pages of a book whose author is God. And he wanted to know the meaning of uh, this book. And so after the two years of teaching, Emerson and um, uh, Tyndall set off to Marburg in what was in 1848 uh, a Europe uh, in grips of revolutions. So all these, these red dots you can see on the map are the various revolutions that were going on around the time. Germany didn't exist. Um, there was the Confederation of German States. And they went to join the group of Robert Bunsen. Um, famous for his Bunsen burner, who is shown seated here uh, alongside Kirchhoff, and did his PhD uh, in the area of um, mathematics. Then after completing his PhD, he went on to work in magnetism and diamagnetism. So I'm not a specialist in <clears throat> magnetism and it can be quite a challenge. You have magnetic materials, fer ferromagnetic materials, paramagnetic materials, anti-ferromagnetic materials, and diamagnetic materials, and more. And so for non-experts, this can be something of a head explosion. And so where I want to start is for people who are not specialists, magnet um, gets its name from a region in Greece, Magnesia, because it is the stone from Magnesia this region in Greece. And hopefully by this time next year or a bit before, we'll all be going back to places like this. So what in terms of diamagnetism, it was realized yeah, by the first observed by the Dutch um, physicist Anton Brugmans that he was looking at various materials to see what would happen with a magnet. Would they be attracted uh, um, or would they be unrepelled or no effect? And he either floated them on mercury or put them on a small piece of paper and then brought the magnet towards them. But he noticed one peculiarity. Only the dark and almost violet colored bismuth displayed a very peculiar property in that it's repelled by both poles of a magnet. So he had understood if this is the first observation of diamagnetism. Um, the next significant work was that of Faraday. Um, and he mentions that to observe diamagnetism, the effects to be described do require magnetic apparatus of great power, as you can see it is, and under perfect command. And what he found was that this material and others aligned not like metal, but aligned across the magnetic field, perpendicular. So he said the lining across it gets the name diamagnetism. And Faraday went on to look at what other materials could be diamagnetic, um, such as bits of apple, uranium, blood clots, and many more. So at this point, I thought I'd show you a movie. 
Um, <clears throat> and the movie is going to be about levitating pyrolytic graphite. So you know, here what I have is I have a very small piece of pyrolytic graphite on styrofoam floating in water. And you can see that it's been repelled by the, it could be that, oh yes, it's just magnetic. But then I turn it around and it's also repelled by the other pole of the magnet. So this material, which is like graphite, like pencil lead, but very highly ordered, and it's made from high temperature decomposition of, of um, uh, methane, for example, is repelled by both poles of a magnet, this is diamagnetism. What I have in my hand is the material that uh, Faraday and Tyndall would have worked with. This is bismuth, and it is the most, uh, most diamagnetic material that is naturally occurring. And this contrasts, that weak force I've just shown you, contrasts with magnetism. I'm sure we've all been mesmerized at some point by magnetism and just how strong this force is. It's picking up this object. It's spinning in circle. It's also spinning on its own axis. It's a planetary motion. And it can pick it up and move it against the full force of the pull of the earth. So these are magnets. Magnets, of course, will pick up magnetic material, you know, iron, cobalt, and nickel. And what I have here is an array of strong magnets, neodymium, iron, boron magnets, and they're arranged in nine by nine grid in a north, south, north, south quadrupole arrangement. And that is the square of pyrolytic graphite, which means the firestone graphite. And here we have a ring, and you can clearly see with the ring that it is hovering stably above the array of magnets, and there is no energy input. This isn't cooled, this is room temperature, stable diamagnetic levitation. And what I have here is a piece of film that allows you to view magnetic fields. This shows you the magnetic field above the material because it has little pieces of iron suspended in oil between two sheets of plastic, which allows you to view the magnetic field. And you can see that the poles of the magnet in dark, and when the field goes from north to south, it's light. And here I'm again showing that this piece, it levitates always at the cross. Now the table isn't totally level and there's no friction, so it'll just float off. But you can see it always goes to the interception point of the four magnets. And this again shows you the field pattern. And you can see the force pulling it down because it has the iron inside. So what I want to do in the next slide is just based on that, I thought, have a bit of fun, have a quiz. If I take this piece of pyrolytic graphite, which is square, almost the same size, just slightly bigger than the magnets, and I place this onto the magnetic grid, would it sit like this? Would it sit like this? Or would it sit like this? So this is pyrolytic graphite. Um, you have, um, I don't know, a couple of seconds while you go for that, I think there's uh... Okay, so now you've had uh, time to think about it. The answer is this orientation. It's 45 degrees rotated. To understand why, um, thanks to some colleagues at Tyndall, uh, Prane, Paul, and Declan, who have simulated the magnetic field due to this quadrupole arrangement. And this is the perpendicular vector of this field. And this is the highest field, this is the lowest field. 
and to obtain the minimum exposure to the high field regions, it sits like this, rotated by 45 degrees. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this little bit of video because I see um, you're already over 25 minutes in. Um, I just want to talk about the historical context before we look at what Tyndall did. You had, in at this time in 1850, there was certainly an idea of an atomic age all the way back to uh, Democritus, the idea of a universe of infinite, uncreated and eternal atoms. And he was ahead of his time. Then uh, Dalton saying that all matter is composed of atoms, indivisible and indestructible building blocks. And, but it was not the subatomic age. And this is important to remember is the atom turns out it wasn't indivisible after all, it was divisible. But these, these experiments showing electrons and showing the atom or all, all its mass at the center came after, um, came after Tyndall's work. So when Tyndall came to this area, magnetism and diamagnetism, there was a number of conflicting results. Um, for example, there was some work showing that the diamagnetic force decreases faster with distance than the magnetic force. Also that the optical axis of crystals can be repelled by the poles of a magnet. For example, this is an um, Icelandic spa, um, which undergoes uh, biofringence and has one optic axis. So this was a confusing situation. You had uh, a magneto uh, crystallic force inherent in crystals, one induced by magnetic fields and another inherent um, in crystals, which is the optical axis force. So what Tyndall did, and he had built his own uh, equipment having to apply magnetic fields and a torsion balance. And he had to build all this up himself, design it and build it up to construct. And look from above, he had a, a long uh, piece of wood here where he could put in his material, for example, bismuth, which was suspended by up to three feet of thread or, or um, silver wire. Then you could turn on these helical coils to generate a magnetic field, which would deflect the, the galvanometer and you turn the torsion until it returns back to zero. And he took tremendous care as an experimentalist. Um, as he says here, he neglected no precaution to secure the perfect purity of the substances he examined. I won't go through this whole list here, but you can see even with the bismuth, after taking the metal of commerce and dissolving it in nitric acid, going through another eight steps, boiling it in hydrochloric acid, and also very careful on where he obtained, say, sulfur and calcareous um, spar, and particularly he wanted to be sure that there was no ferrous iron. So he went through very careful experiments to ensure there was no iron in the material because this would dominate the weaker um, uh, diamagnetic force he was looking for. And this result was very important. He was uh, able to show by very, very careful measurements that the force of attraction and repulsion in diamagnetism is precisely the same. Uh, law as in magnetism. So it wasn't different laws of nature that were being considered. And this is through very careful experimentation. And this, um, in terms of diamagnetism, it may be of interesting to note that right back in 1846, at the same time, William Thompson, um, and alone later as Lord Kelvin, predicted that you should be able to achieve stable levitation through diamagnetism but doubted there would be magnets strong enough or diamagnetic material light enough to, to see the effect. Uh, the first demonstration with an electromagnet came in 1939 with uh, Werner Braunbeck. And then many years later, um, Andre Geim uh, won the Ig Nobel Prize for levitating a live frog in a 16 Tesla magnetic field. So I'm sure that frog um, 
he or she must have been very surprised had great stories to tell. Um, this won the Ig Nobel Prize for work that makes you at first um, laugh and, and secondly think. And the work that Tyndall did on uh, diamagnetism is very accurate uh, measurements attracted the attention of Faraday, uh, who was the director of the laboratory. And based on this work and on his work on the orientation of magnets in the field, he was appointed the professor of natural philosophy at the Royal Institute in 1853. So now um, we come to the next section, absorption of radiant heat by gases. This goes back um, <clears throat> a while. So to place it in context, um, uh, Jean uh, Baptiste Joseph Fourier, who uh, some of you may know probably through Fourier series, others may know through heat flow equations, maybe not so many, on the question what is the temperature of the Earth's surface? So Fourier asked himself this um, question Every day, the sun's rays strike the Earth and warm it up. So why doesn't our planet just keep heating up until it gets as hot as the sun? So what he suggested is there must, the heated surface must emit a non-luminous heat, something that was carrying away the heat energy into space. And he did very accurate measurements of heat flow, which is the main part of his study. But when he calculated this mathematically, what he found was the the globe should just uh, should be an ice ball with, with average temperatures below zero. So he was aware that there was something stopping uh, the emission of heat, like a, a box with a glass lid on that the air will heat up. And at this point, Tyndall became involved and started to work on the absorption of radiant heat by gases and vapors. And he described this as a perfectly unexplored field of inquiry. So he wanted to work on this question of absorption of radiant heat in gases. But he had to build his own equipment, think about it, conceive the equipment, work with equipment makers to build the entire equipment equipment and then run its experiments. And this shows Tyndall's ratio spectrophotometer. It's composed of, if you see what I've just circled there in blue, um, an infrared source, which is a, called a Leslie cube. And this was only a recent in, invention by um, a Leslie, a Scottish uh, scientist, where you put boiling water in inside this cube and then you can have shiny surfaces or black surfaces and they give off different levels of radiant heat and then this heat enters into the tube here through a window which is transparent to infrared radiation which is rock salt the next part of this setup was how do you measure the difference in temperature and this is the device here it was a thermopile. And um, this is based on some uh, recent findings. The Zeebeck effect, which came in 1826. If you have two dissimilar materials and you connect at their junction, if this maintained at a different temperature, there's a voltage. And only, um, and probably, uh, yeah, less than 10 years later, Maloney uh, in Italy put these together in series because the amount of voltage was very small. This is microvolts per Kelvin. But if you put them together in series, what he noticed is you could make an infrared detector. Here is the Leslie cube, here is the detector, which could detect a person at 30 feet or a cow at 100 feet. So there was infrared detectors already available in the 30s. And what Tyndall did is to bring all these different components together and to make this entirely new experimental facility and to do his work. So this shows the really great experimentalist that he was. And here it is. 
if we look here, this is the relative uh, absorption. So the difference in this ratio spectrophotometer, air compared to oxygen, nitrogen and hydrogen are all the same. But as you go down, you see this. It's the gas of carbonic acid, which we know today as carbon dioxide. And so he had realized that this gas, which is you couldn't see I mean, inside the tube, it's, it's totally it appears transparent to visible light, but to radiant heat, it appeared, as he said, almost perfectly uh, black. And the most was ammonia. He tested many other materials, um, finding hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen to be transparent, carbon dioxide, water, and ammonia. Uh, he also looked at coal gas and perfumes. These are all strongly absorbing. And the, the effect of water vapor, for example, was 16,000 times higher than pure air. And this comment, I think, is worth uh, reading through in one of his papers. Tyndall said, remove for a single summer night the aqueous vapor from the air which overspreads this country and you would assuredly destroy every plant capable of being destroyed by a freezing temperature. The warmth of our fields and gardens would pour itself unrequited into space and the sun would rise upon an island held fast in the iron grip of frost. Well, this was realized um, soon, very soon by Herschel has been a huge step forward in um, meteorology showing that dry air was effectively uh, transparent, um, but that moisture is what stops the sun's heat. And interestingly, Tyndall used his infrared bolometer, pointed at many things, including the moon at night and pointed out over London. And here's a picture of London in the 1860s. And he said that London appeared to be a heat island, which of course now we know to be true, cities do trap. Uh, the, the heat at night. And so this, so in 1862, what Tyndall had described, um, what is the key to climate change, that water vapor and carbon dioxide are opaque to radiant heat rays. And if you look here at this graph, it will give you a feeling. This is the average temperatures from 2010 to 2019 compared to 1951 to 1978. And you can see one to two degrees C hotter and up along the North Pole, alarmingly up to four degrees C higher temperatures. And just this year, the, the, uh, the polar regions are not freezing as normal. And the Northwest Passage was actually open a few years ago. And I noticed this from his very careful experimentation. It's worth mentioning that before publishing, Tyndall would make hundreds of measurements to make sure they were accurate and reproducible before publication. And I just want to show in in recognition of um, his work, there was the Tyndall Center for Climate Change was set up um, in the UK, I uh, think 20 years ago, uh, bringing together both scientists and politicians to, to help inform society in its transition to a sustainable and um, low carbon future. I, When I was looking through this in, entirely, um, by accident while looking for something else. I realized that someone else had been looking at the same uh, subject on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, Eunice Newton Foote, uh, shown here, published um, a short, uh, very important two page paper. And it's worth picking out some of the points from this. She had two tubes where one, she said she re reduced the pressure, exhausted the tube, another condensed the tube, and then put them into the sunlight to see what happened. 
Her first point is that the action of the heating increases with the density of the air. The second she spotted is that the action of the sun's rays was found to be considerably higher in moist than dry air or to vapor. And thirdly, the highest effect of the sun's rays I have found is to be in carbonic acid gas. And it's almost certain that Tyndall would have known nothing about this, uh, but it was uh, a few years before. And not only did she report these measurements, but she saw the significance of carbonic, as carbonic acid gas in the atmosphere on the climate. So I'm sure there'll be moves soon to, to place uh, Eunice Newton foot along uh, with Tyndall in, in um, realizing it'd be some of the first work on, on, on global warming, the origins of global warming. So um, Tyndall scattering. What Tyndall was working then on absorption of radiant heat or in gases. So it seemed natural maybe to move to what about visible light? Um, so what he did here, and this is his equipment, which is in the Royal Institution in London. He had a, a long pipe and a light source. Um, I just saw as I was doing this earlier today, that this wouldn't have been the light source because this is a Edison bulb. It would have been some other light source shining into the tube and would gradually fill the tube with smoke. And what he realized is that as it was filling with smoke, if you looked edge on, it had a slightly bluish tinge. But if you looked end on, it looked more towards uh, the red end of the spectrum. And what he had found is that scattering of beams of light from a medium containing small suspended particles what he realized is there was more scattering towards the high energy or the blue end of the spectrum than the red. And he thought that scattering, depending on the wavelength, was an explanation for why the sky um, is blue. And I wrote a paper on this in 1868. And some examples of Tyndall scattering, uh, we see that the sunset does look red. If you put uh, flower uh, into water, you will see scattering where it has a bluish tinge. Why your eye is blue, this is Tyndall scattering. The sky is blue, very interesting one because the concept was right, but it's not really the suspended particles, it's the air itself which is the primary reason. But conceptually, he had understood the point that blue is scattered more uh, than red. Um, and opals. If you look at opals, it, it, it scatters here from an angle blue, but if you look end on, you'll see the orange red part of the spectrum. So this is Tyndall moving from uh, infrared into visible light. Um, so bending light in a falling jet of water. Then reflection and refraction of light is something that have been studied, of course, for, for centuries, and I'll, I'll pick out just a few. Um, it was the great work of um, Ibn al-Haytham uh, on his book of optics, where he was looking at the laws of the angle of incidence and the angle of ref um, reflection, also at refraction. And it was at this time that um, he, the question was, did your eyes send out a beam which bounced back or does light bounce off an object into your eyes? Um, um, what he was able to show is that it's actually light coming into your eyes and not the eye does not see, it's the brain uh, that sees. Um, then the work of uh, Johannes Kepler in dioptrics in uh, 1611, looking more at the relation of the angles of incident and reflection. And when you go past a certain angle, a critical angle, you will have total internal reflection. And um, this was first demonstrated in Paris in um, 1842 by Jean Daniel uh, Collodon with a light source where in a dark room, the light came out and was guided through a falling jet of water. And this is one of the many uh, demonstrations that Tyndall worked on. So this leads us into 
Tyndall as a communicator of science. He uh, gave this demonstration and many others. He gave hundreds of lectures on communicating uh, science to the general public. And here's a sketch of him presenting in the Royal Institution. He wrote books on heat and books on light and books on sound. Um, he gave a very successful uh, tour of the USA in 1872. And his takings from this tour, it was very, very popular in both um, all across America, that his, he had 13,000 um, dollars in profit over his expenses, um, of which he gave all of it away uh, to the benefit of science in America, left it in the hands of trustees. And amongst other things, um, this was given to graduate fellowships in Harvard, Columbia, Pennsylvania University and elsewhere. Yeah, I think it says a lot about him that um, he showed that you can make money out of science communication, but then he subsequently gave it all the way for the continued continuing benefit of science. I'm just checking on my time. So here's a little movie, um, which uh, I took in the in the lab, in the electrical characterization lab in Tyndall. So here he would not have had a laser, but I have a laser going through water, shining onto the uh, center of Tyndall by Roland Jackson. Now I open the top, and the water comes out through the small hole. Then align the laser beam with the light, and you can see that the laser light follows the curve of the falling water. And this is total internal reflection of light. And this, of course, is the forerunner to the optical fiber. And it's very relevant to a, a quote that Tyndall had that knowledge. Uh, once gained, casts a light beyond its immediate boundaries. And when I was putting and uh, leading into optical fibers, for optical fiber communications, you know, optical fibers used in uh, cameras for surgery, um, et cetera. And I was wondering about this gap of a uh, hundred years. Was there really this gap? But um, no, I was interested to find out that Alexander Graham Bell yeah, the the invention that he was most proud of was his photophone, which is communicating uh, with light as opposed to uh, electricity along wires. And John Logie Baird of TV fame um, in 1926 suggested you could have a transmission of moving images through a, a network of optical fibers by total internal reflection but they were never really developed on. And it was the 70s when optical fibers came into their own for their optical communication. I haven't really said much about Tyndall, um, about the person, you know, apart from his great communicator and handing away all this money then subsequently to the benefit of, of science. Um, he married in his 50s and he married uh, Louisa Hamilton, 1876 and uh, by all accounts this was a very uh, happy marriage they both loved hiking and there's a picture here of a mountain almost 14,000 feet that um, you know, they climbed um, the, on the year they were married they also had a chalet a built uh, in a lap in Switzerland in 1877 and you can see a picture here of Tyndall sitting by the gate and uh, Louisa is up uh, by by the door um, this brings me now to the Ask the Audience choice. Um, I have to just check here uh, on the vote. Um, I don't know whether uh, Sarah or, or Martin could jump in and, and tell me. Hi. Yeah. Um, so the uh, winner of the poll was Glaciers. All right. OK. It's very, very brief. Uh, I'll go on to Glaciers. I'll go past optically pure germ theory. Um, zoom past uh, mountaineering, uh, zoom past foghorns, very brief. But he, because he was a mountaineer and actually made an ascent of a number 
our, our peaks in the Alps first ascent, he um, was very interested in glaciers, both writing about his ascent of glaciers, uh, the origin of glaciers, about the motion of glaciers. Um, there was um, quite a lot of communication because uh, James Forbes was also working on glaciers and described the motion of glaciers as that of a, a viscous fluid. Um, and after visiting the Alps, uh, Tyndall proposed an alternative theory which combined fracture and regelation. And um, regelation is um, something I think was actually first recorded by Faraday. If you have a, an ice block below temperature and you have a weight and a, uh, a thin piece of metal, it will gradually cut through the ice by pressure. But when it goes all the way through, the ice will seal again. So it will reform um, uh, once the, the pressure re uh, reducing the temperature pulling through the ice, it then reforms by regelation. This will work for materials which expand upon freezing. Well, um, in terms of cold, I think their, their relationship was quite frosty as well, because um, Tyndall and Forbes were in a lot of discussion over who found um, what theory first. And, uh, I think it was finally, finally resolved. So I can move on uh, to some of um, my final thoughts. John Tyndall is an experimental scientist. Uh, scientific theories, uh, there was a quote, and I don't know where I found this quote, but it stuck with me. That in science, it's an attempt to find the general from the particular, and it's an attempt to find the timeless from the transitory. But if you're going to do this, you must have accurate experiments. These particulars are very important. Um, this data you're going to be using, otherwise you could be sent off down blind alleys. And also the measurements of um, effects changing with time. And this is what Tyndall was. He was one of the greatest experimental scientists of the 19th century, coming up with the ideas, building the equipment, based on some very recent uh, observations. And so he said himself, the brightest flashes in the world of thought are incomplete until they have been proven to have their counterparts in the world of fact. So whether you are gathering information to develop a scientific theory or testing the, and the validity of a scientific theory that, that has been proposed, the experiments are absolutely vital. Um, without question, Tyndall was one of the greatest experimental scientists of the 19th century. And how do we view Tyndall now from two centuries later? Well, global warming, um, which he understood through the um, absorption of, of infrared radiation by water vapor and carbon dioxide, is of course very important to us. A map here showing carbon dioxide and average global temperatures. He is also remembered through optical communications, his work on transfer of light through various media um, and is recognized uh, by the IEEE Photonic Society John Tyndall Award, um, which is given uh, annually in the field of optics. And I think he's also remembered as a science communicator. He spent an enormous effort communicating science and the importance of science to the general public at uh, all ages. And um, what he showed, interestingly, is not only is it popular, but it was profitable, even though on occasions he gave the money away. And he's remembered um, in glaciers and in mountains. This is the Tyndall Glacier in Chile. Um, you can see here it's uh, receding. This is its current uh, position. He has a um, memorial where he built his chalet uh, in Bilap in Switzerland. There's Mount Tyndall in California near Mount Whitney. And for those of you who like rock climbing, there's also Mount Tyndall in Tasmania. 
and our own institute and um, doing our part to keep his name alive and his work is highly relevant to what uh, we study here in Tyndall. Integrating magnetics and photonics with electronics for communication, um, information and communication technologies for energy, both macro and micro technologies and how you can use them to reduce carbon dioxide um, in the atmosphere. Information communication technologies for health and also the agri-tech and food security sector. And what Tyndall brings together is, is also relevant to John Tyndall because there are people involved in chemistry, in physics, um, in circuit design, trying to bring all these together to develop um, deep technology research that can be uh, have relevance and application across communications, health, energy, and the environment. This, to finish up, and a few minutes to go, is I think one of my favorite um, images of Tyndall because you had to stay very still for a long time, I imagine for pictures in the 1850s and 60s. And this is a painting of Tyndall by uh, John Hamilton. Um, and it's in the National Portrait Gallery. And there we see him, draftsman, surveyor, geologist, atmospheric physicist, a professor of physics, a science communicator, microbiologist, mountaineer, and I didn't get a chance to mention it, but also a poet. And so, happy 200th birthday, John Tyndall. And I would like to give special thanks to uh, Roland Jackson, because I have been spending a lot of time researching this presentation with his book, his biography of Tyndall. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Cliff Perrin, who gave me uh, lots of advice as well as lots of magnets and pyrolytic graphite to demonstrate uh, diamagnetic levitation. Um, I would like to think, thank lots of colleagues at um, Tyndall um, and UCC. There's so many that I better start naming them because I'll leave someone out, but big thank you. Um, we're funded to continue research into materials and devices and, and scientific research through Science Foundation Island. And I'm also involved in a national center, um, you know, the, the AMBER Center, uh, to, where we investigate both optical devices, electronic devices, and photonic devices, very relevant to the work of Tyndall. Um, I would also, of course, like to thank especially the Royal Institution for this opportunity to talk a little about some aspects of the life and work of this amazing uh, 19th century uh, scientist. But most importantly, I, I would like to thank you uh, for your interest uh, and for connecting in. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>